Uh, tonight we have a special night where we have a joint collabor a collaboration between the AIE, the Australian Institute of Energy, the Victorian branch, and the Energy Efficiency Council. And in a way tonight they're going to present, as you can see on the chairs, the, energy efficiency, the Australian Energy Efficiency Policy Handbook, which is a very interesting and very important tool that can help foster discussion about energy efficiency and action within Australia. Uh, a few words about the AIE. Uh, well, I'll use the same approach of questions. Has anybody here not heard about the AIE? Just to get some feeling and feedback. Okay, cool. So I see everybody has heard of the AIE. Uh, so I'll yeah, send one line. Uh, the way we see the AIE, our activity, our vision, and our mission is to help share knowledge and facilitate networking. That's why in an event like this, we have the, the uh, excellent speakers we have, and afterwards we encourage everybody to stay, have a drink, ask questions, exchange business cards, and just network. And I'd like to invite the first speaker of, of the night, Rob Moy Leach, to uh, present the, uh, the uh, handbook, the policy handbook. Rob is a head of policy of the Energy Efficiency Council, which is a big body for energy efficiency in Australia. He was formerly part of the Grand Climate Change Review and the Prime Minister's Task Force on Energy Efficiency. Thank you very much. Um, so, completely unrelated, I like to talk about unrelated things uh, at the beginning because we always talk about energy efficiency. Uh, last night I had a beer and um, I, as many people do, and the, the guy actually gave me way too much change. He gave me like $19 when he only owed me $9. And I gave him $10 back. And my friend was kind of stunned and the bartender was kind of stunned. And then me and my friend, because we're dorks, spent the rest of the evening trying to work out how a neoclassical economist would have explained what I did. And the answer is he would have probably explained it as it didn't happen because never let data get in the way of a good theory. Um, and there's a couple of economists, who, uh, psychologists, economists who I really like, Tversky and Kahneman, whose stuff is great. Um, they do a lot of stuff around heuristics and why people act irrationally and how they don't actually conform with a sort of rational actor model. Um, and, you know, fascinating stuff. So this is, um, this is uh, two, it's multiple states in the US, but on the left hand you have the donation rate where you have opt-in donations. And on the uh, opt-out level, you have twice as many donations as a, as a percentage of the population when it's just an opt-out, so you basically one state you kind of say, yep, I want to be a donor. Only 42% of people are donors. In the states where they say, oh, you have to sign this if you don't want to be a donor, then only 18% of people drop out. It's an astonishing difference. Um, but I often think as well we, we, we get too complex with these explanations around behavioral economics because really what this is about is people are fundamentally really, really lazy. And if you're kind of giving people a bunch of options, um, and one of them is really, really simple. They're going to take that option almost every time, which is why a few years ago I banned these from the office, um, because I really, really hate them. Um, because if it's a choice of going for a five-minute walk and getting an apple, or taking a one-minute walk and paying 60 cents for something that's horrific, I will always do the latter. Um, that's completely irrelevant. So, um, very quickly, what I'm, I'm not going to actually go through the handbook in too much detail, because you've got copies of it there, and, it will bore you your socks off if I kind of spend 20 minutes going through something you can read very fast. Um, but I'm going to talk about a few of the basic concepts in there. So I'm going to start with sort of optimizing investment, then some of the energy market distortions, which I think is really relevant for this group. A um, bit of what is the handbook and some of the priorities that are, that are in it. So first thing about energy efficiency is it's, as you all know, it's multiple markets. So it's markets for building, design and construction, advisory services, energy and appliances, problems in any of those markets affect each other. And so sort of coming back a little bit to this picture here, you know, everything is related. You don't just have everyone on the same starting level. So if we think about optimizing investment in, for example, a building, uh, and you've got a choice of the Tesla batteries and the PV, or you could have a diesel gen set, I don't care what it is, on your supply side, and then demand side, your insulation, the efficiency of the air conditioning, what you're basically trying to achieve through that combination of investments is a cost-effective, cool, comfortable home in summer. And what you can see from when you put it this simply is actually a really clear choice of investment. So if you underinvest in your demand side investments, you have to spend a lot more on supply. So it's a much more expensive solution and will also have actually much larger environmental impacts. 
Um, if you think about this off-grid house, and incident, this is the least ugly one I could find online, um, you kind of think about what they talk about as the classic barriers to energy efficiency. Information asymmetry, which means that there's a difference between what sellers have and what buyers have in terms of knowledge, so there's a lack of trust there. Uh, imperfect information, I'm sure if any of you guys are consultants out there, you might find your clients often have imperfect information uh, when you're trying to explain issues to them. Band rationality, which is the sort of Kahneman and Tversky stuff, um, people actually don't process infinite amounts of information in zero time. I certainly don't. Transaction costs, things are a bit of a pain in the butt to do, and access to capital, you have to, you have to find funding. What you realize is that these barriers actually uh, apply to both the supply and the demand side. And so you're actually going to end up with a reasonably balanced investment in supply and demand, just in pure incentives. Now, people still may not have perfect information, and in an ideal world, what they would do is they'd come to a consultant or somebody who had really good knowledge to give them this balanced package of investment, what's the most cost-effective way of balancing my supply and demand. But, I'm not going to go into that now, as soon as you connect to the network in Australia, you have some serious problems. Because effectively what's happened is somebody has put the candy box right next to you. Um, you've got networks who are mandated to act on the behalf of consumers. They take money from consumers whether consumers want it or not. They smear those costs over time, over space, over consumers. Um, and what you end up with is effectively supply happens at almost no effort on the behalf of the consumers. Then you add in some really major distortions we've got in terms of imperfect pricing and misaligned incentives, which basically means it's much easier for networks to build huge amounts of kit and make lots of money out of it than to actually do their job. Um, and you start to get some serious problems. And what you realize is those barriers have effectively been eliminated on the left-hand side. So all those sort of barriers in terms of people can't think perfectly, they don't have infinite information, they don't need to worry about that anymore. There's actually a network company doing it on behalf of them by law and in spreading those costs. So yes, we can certainly pick up and fix some of the imperfect pricing and some of these misaligned incentives, but that still won't deal with this real distortion we have between supply and demand in the whole energy market. So we have a lot of problems there. Effectively, what we're asking consumers to do is say, okay, well, we'll connect you in here, we'll smear costs over time, but if you want to put in a more efficient air conditioner, you have to find the capital, you have to work it out yourself, you have to think about the balance, and you have to trust us that we're not going to change the price signals for the next 10 years, which is an interesting proposition to an energy user. So in fact, I actually find it extraordinary there's as much energy efficiency happening as there is when you think of it this way. Um, now, I'm obviously going to be quite biased towards energy efficiency. Um, but this is the former coalition energy minister ran the Coag Energy Market Review in 2002. It's pretty damning. He's basically saying there's very little demand side in the energy market because the NEM, the national energy market, is supply side focused and demand side can't gain the full value of what it sells. I mean, it's, it's pretty brutally put. And that was in 2002. And since then, we have really done very little to solve those problems. The Australian Energy Market Commission is making very incremental changes. So that was the problem we had before with the previous set of technologies. And what's fascinating at the moment is we're getting this very, very different range of technologies coming through. The cost of, uh, of PVs dropped so fast. I find this astonishing. I love this fact that there was an assessment of who did the best projections of PV prices in Europe. Um, I think it was the, uh, the IEA did this a few years ago. And they found out that Greenpeace had done the best projections, not because they were accurate, but because they were still underestimating how fast the price had dropped. So that's caused you know, massive rapid change in generation technologies. But if you sort of think about it, um, the thicker colors sort of represent where you've got control. We've gone from a system where you had very hard to even measure demand, let alone control demand at an individual building level. Um, but it was very easy to control supply. You had sort of lots of forms of supply you could switch on and off quite easily through to a situation where generation technologies are increasingly intermittent. And I think Bruce is going to probably talk about this a little bit later. Um, and demand is uh, much more controllable and much more transparent. So we've actually suddenly gone from having lots of control over supply and very little over demand to a whole range of new technologies that are effectively flipping that, that system. So that, for me, sounds like a huge opportunity. In the context of that, we've released this handbook. Um, what is the aim of the handbook? It's to unlock what is cost-effective energy efficiency. Not all energy efficiency is cost-effective. But the handbook's trying to bring together experts' knowledge, informed debates, so very much what the AIE is trying to do, and inform policy development. 
Um, it's supposed to be independent, honest, and long-term. We're pretty brutal about what we do and don't know in there. And it's also providing a form of debate. So this is a first ish edition. We will be updating this next year, and we're really keen for people to get involved. And if you go to our website, um, you, can, you can sign up to get involved in the update of this, of this handbook. Um, the other thing that's really important is it's evidence-based. So that's based on research, but also a lot of our members' experience uh, and where we've just got good confidence will say things very clearly. So there's some things which are clear actions, like government efficiency. We're very, very clear about what you need to do to make governments efficient in their own operations because the, the data is 100% in on that. And there's areas where you have to do design and tests, so residential energy efficiency disclosure, um, which is basically neighbours rating for households. We need to design that system. It's going to take a little bit of time to knock the bugs out before that becomes mandatory. Uh, there are going to be some things where you just need to throw a few ideas at a wall and see what sticks, like building fabric retrofits for small homes. And then there's areas of research. Um, what are the drivers for upgrading hotels? That's a really complex area that people don't have much knowledge about. So what we've done is we've put in, um, distilled it down to sort of nine priorities in the big book into the small book, um, which is really aimed at sort of politicians more than anything else, um, to try and kind of get their head over something which they're not going to read 40 pages ever. Um, I'm not sure they can physically read 40 pages. <laughs> Um, there's five cross-sectoral policies and four sectoral ones. The cross-sectoral ones are fair and efficient tariffs. This is an absolute no-brainer. If you don't have fair tariffs, you can't expect people to be making sensible investments. Then you have electricity network regulations. I think we are astoundingly successful in Australia at possibly having, I'm, I'm convinced, possibly the world's worst network regulations in the moment. So that's something we can be quite proud of. Um, I think somewhere we need to have the big gold-plated pylon, you know, like you have the big merino ship. Um, Energy efficiency schemes, which are a very good proxy for trying to fix the energy market. Minimum standards for uh, particularly um, appliances, uh, buildings, and Anna's done a lot of work in vehicles. And finally, the sort of $470 billion global opportunity. That's the size of the market, global market for energy efficiency services and products. It's predicted to double by 2020. Um, that's multiple studies have put it at around that figure. And so we really need to basically um, strengthen the market in Australia if we really can have an opportunity to export internationally. Sectoral priorities, um, the big ones for us are reducing government's energy bills because that makes a huge, uh, what you find around the world is once you get governments to actually get the house in order, it actually kickstarts the energy efficiency services market. Modernising manufacturing, um, which is around sort of trying to deliver multiple forms of benefit, not just energy efficiency and energy productivity, but resource efficiency, energy efficiency, and multiple forms of productivity to the manufacturing sector at the same time. Um, transforming offices, which is around, uh, we've got a very long way with our premium offices in Australia, which are actually world leading, but below that is a lot of dross. Uh, and residential energy efficiency disclosure, which is a huge priority for us right now, because until we get this in, we really can't make the big dents that we want in our space. I will leave it there for now because I'm just trying to paint a very big picture and then pass them to somebody who's going to go into far more detail, which is Anna in the climate change space, and then Bruce will be getting into some real nitty-gritties of what this looks like in practice. Thanks very much.